Hey everyone, Carmen here, Managing Digital Editor at Ms. and I am with Tara Graham from Just Attention International. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I am so excited. So I guess, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what brings you to the National Sexual Assault Conference? Sure, well I'm here, like you said, with uh, Just Attention International, or JDI, and our mission is to end sexual violence in all forms of confinement. And in coming here to INSAC, it's an opportunity to connect with victim service providers and help them to understand what, what is happening, the reality of what's happening inside confinement facilities, and also to empower them to provide supports to incarcerated survivors and also to survivors who are come back to our homes and communities. Totally. And, you know, this year's theme is all about sort of moving beyond this breakthrough of Me Too, but I know there's also a lot of different communities of survivors that maybe didn't even get to really benefit from that breakthrough. Um, would you say that Me Too and sort of all this new energy and groundswell of people talking about sexual violence has sort of spurred the work on? Have you seen some advances? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it definitely gives voice to work that has been going on in terms of ending this, um, this issue of sexual violence in confinement facilities. Uh, you know, the, the Prison Rape Elimination Act was passed in 2003 unanimously by Congress. When did that last happen? And national standards were promulgated in 2012. So we've been really working on it. Lots of people around the nation have been working since 2012 on the ground to really make facilities safe. Um, and so I think that it gives, the Me Too movement definitely gives rise to asking that question like, oh, who else is this impact and how can we make a difference in making yeah, and what are some of the what are some of the guidelines that were laid down by Priya that maybe need to be strengthened or that provided really good models for moving forward? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, we we often think about Priya as the standards that were promulgated as um, the floor, and that you can always do more. Yeah. And so I think that sometimes it's just even getting a foothold for people to say yes, we're going to pay attention, yes, we're committed to making our facilities safer, and if something should happen, doing the right thing and getting supports for people and holding um, perpetrators accountable. Um, but then also working with those agencies that are willing to do more, to really go above what the baseline is. Um, and so, you know, in the victim services, um, you know, looking at it from the victim services angle, the PREA standards require that there's victim advocacy provided to individuals when they go out for a forensic exam or investigatory interviews, and that anyone, no matter when they may have experienced sexual abuse, any time in their lives, that they can have access to confidential um, support services. Um, but what we've seen is that um, places that, like, really great models of partnerships have been created. So it's not just that the access to those services is by mail, but it's in person. Maybe there are groups going on. JDI has been doing um, in-person, multi-session art therapy workshops. So there are models and there are opportunities. It just sometimes takes some finagling to figure out the best angle to start building those relationships and then building them. Right, and, and how can, I know this is this is what you were here to talk about, but mm -hmm. how can folks who are doing this work on the outside sort of do work that is impacting survivors who are on the inside? In terms of the victim service providers? Yeah. Um, I mean, and I think in terms of challenging culture, right? Like when we talk about challenging rape culture, how do we make sure that we're not leaving just large right. swaths of people out of that conversation? Right. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So earlier today, um, one of my co-presenters said it as sort of like, you know, taking stock of what you have. And so as a victim services organization, it's if there's a desire to serve an incarcerated survivor or you know work with them once post-release, um, making sure that the that internal in your organization that you're set up in a way to be able to do that successfully. Um, and so I think it is really kind of taking stock of what you have and, and asking some tough questions of um, the organization and of your, your staff to make sure that you're well positioned to provide those services. Um, and I think it's just constantly driving home. Yeah, I mentioned this morning in my session that there are still, I mean, it's its a rare time when I don't turn on the TV and whether it be in pop culture, you know, TV or radio or whatever, that there isn't some mission, mention of the criminal justice system. 
say nothing of like what what you deserve or what you might get as you know rape jokes about you know prison rape jokes and so we need to like really stop having those things crop up a woman this morning even mentioned there's a spongebob square pants a cartoon for kids where there has even been mentions of well, and, you know, I think something else I've been talking to folks about today who were more focused on corporate work was sort of this idea, right, of what about workplaces has to change? Like, what do we have to dismantle about our culture of work that would facilitate an end to harassment and violence at work? And so, similarly, what do you feel structurally about the carceral system really has to change in order to facilitate even being able to create, you know, that that goal of an environment free from sexual harassment and violence. So how much time do you have? <laughs> I mean, I think, so I mean, culture change is hard. Yeah. And I, and I think that is, I've, I've been working on this for a long time, and I think that's something that I've not only believed, but have now come to experience. The change is hard. And sometimes it's that, you know, two steps forward, one step back. Um, and I think that it's a, with, in terms of the, the culture of a correctional setting, it's about, um, I think, some successes that I have seen are, um, you know, the buy-in from staff, both from, you know, the line staff all the way up to leadership, um, and not just buy-in, but actually modeling the behavior they want to see. Um, it's about training training staff the way that they should interact with the people that they're, they're working with. Um, and that's and that's not just in terms that's in terms of the language that they're using and um, you know even like when you're you know searches are an inevitable part of being in confinement. No one likes them. No one likes doing them. No one likes being searched. But are there ways that we can do it that are being more trauma informed and aren't going to be aren't going to negatively impact? Um, it's about you know not only the words that you're using say with a prisoner, but the words that you're using between staff, but those are also important. Yeah. Um, some of the things we also talk about is a reporting culture, right? Like, that's fine to set up mechanisms for people to report, but if they're not going to be believed, if nothing's going to be done about them, um, if they feel like they're being punished for having made a report of abuse that they've experienced, why would they report? So, again, how much time do you have? There's a lot of things. And I think there's also value. I've had a lot of um, really wonderful experience about working with inmates themselves. And empowering them, and I think it takes—it's um, a leap of faith for correctional facilities to say, "You're right; they have to be part of the solution too." And I think if they can really have a teamwork approach um, in all aspects and all facets of the facility, that you really can make more long-term lasting change. Yeah, and um, I mean, you have been doing this work for a long time, and I'm—I'm I'm thinking too about the abuse to prison pipeline and the idea that. You know, violence is happening in these spaces, but it also happens way before people enter the spaces. What have you found are some of the best ways, whether it's through policies or through practices, like sort of in the field, what are some of the best ways to disrupt that pipeline and then also sort of stop that cycle? Yeah, I'm not sure I have the answer for, you know, how to stop that pipeline, but I think that when someone is interfacing with the criminal justice system, Training for staff to recognize that um, the reasons why people may end up where they are, you know, we see overrepresentation of you know LGBT people in confinement settings. Well, why is that? Like, let's break that down. Well, because they, you know, transgender people may be, um, you know, they may be disowned by their families or shunned, and you know, face all these abuses and. Um, you know, they end up homeless. And so, like, let's look at the experiences that they have had in their past, you know, because they don't go away. Like, they're going to come with them when they come into the prison or jail or wherever, and it's also going to be with them when they leave. Um, and I think raising that awareness. Um, we've been doing a lot more around talking about self-care, and not only self-care of the inmate population, but also staff, um, which is very touchy-feely. And, um, and so, but to this recognition that we all have some kind of very likely have some kind of trauma history of some sort. And so also having staff think about how that is impacting their work and their interaction with people. Um, and are there ways that we can be doing our work in a different way without compromising the safety and security of the facility, but overall making people feel safe and being trauma informed. Yeah. And what do you what do you think going beyond the breakthrough for um, 
survivors in confinement means? What do you think we really need to sort of be fighting for first and foremost right now in this moment? Um, you know, I think continuing the implementation of the PREA standards and, and a big barrier that we often see is that um, even if, if an incident is substantiated, or, you know, prosecution and, and really holding perpetrators accountable, um, that can fall apart. We are seeing more and more of it happening, um, but that is, that, that I think is one area that we kind of be doing some more. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, this was you. really helpful yeah, and informative. Yeah, Great. and um, I'll I'll make sure everyone knows how to connect with you all and take action Excellent. with you and get involved. Wonderful. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you.